Hello everyone everywhere, Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God, we're so blessed that you're joining us today. It's a joy every time we get together around the Word of God. Amen. We got something very special to go into today as we're beginning to enter the Passover season. And, you know, at the time of this broadcast, uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Passover, uh, all these are coming up within the next two weeks. So I decided today would be a good day just to, to dive in to some important things that many Christians, eh, it may be in the back of their mind somewhere. Someone mentioned something about this before, but but they're more focused on Resurrection Sunday. And that's a good focus to have. But there's many things that are happening that relate directly back to the roots of Judaism and the seven festivals of Judaism and how Jesus is fulfilling, has fulfilled every one of them except one. We'll get to that. But that's why I decided today was a day to lay this foundation so we can build upon again next week and then Resurrection Sunday after that. Praise God. Amen. Let's go to Lord with a word of prayer. We'll go ahead and get started with today's Bible study. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your blessings in our life, in our ministry. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you, in your infinite wisdom, had us to be born in this day and this hour to be alive on this earth at this time for your purposes. It's just not happenstance. It just isn't the way we happen to come about. You had this plan down to the very second. And we have a purpose here right now. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that this broadcast would help someone define their purpose that you have for them. I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead, guide, direct this conversation right now. I pray that someone somewhere would receive Jesus as their Savior right now during this broadcast. And to you, sir, we give all honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. We do this each and every week as we lay the solid foundation upon which we're going to build. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So therefore, say these words out loud with me. Amen. Just repeat after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead and ascended up into heaven and is seated now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he is about to return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Have your Bibles out. Uh, we're going to be going all over, all right? Today we're going to talk about Jesus and the seven festivals of Judaism. Now Jesus, the Son of God, is the most influential, most renowned figure in Christianity, and he should be. Amen. He is revered and worshipped across this world by millions of people. The teachings of his life are the foundation of the Christian faith. He is one of the most, if not the most significant figure in Judaism as he was born and raised as a Jew, not a Christian. He was born and raised as a Jew. And what we're going to talk about today is just a brief exploration of his life and then compare his life to the seven Jewish festivals. Now, first, let me give you some background on the Jewish festivals. Judaism is one of the oldest religions 
in the world, dating back to the time of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. The Jewish calendar is filled with a, a series of festivals and holy days, each with its own unique significance and its own unique meaning. Right, these festivals... These festivals are divided into two categories, agriculture festivals and historical festivals. What's the difference? Well, the agricultural festivals celebrate the cycle of planting, harvesting, the giving of thanks for the, the bounty of the land. The three agricultural festivals are Passover, Shavat, and Sukkot. Passover or Peshach, or, you know, that's where we typically have Resurrection Sunday, right? That's the Passover weekend. Shavat's the Feast of Weeks. Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the historical festivals commemorate very important events in Jewish history. They include Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, Hanukkah, Festival of Lights that we call Christmas, right? Purim, Festival of Lots. And we're going to get into all these. But let's look at the life of Jesus for a moment. Jesus was born in Bethlehem a small, small town in Judea about 2,000 years ago. He was raised in a Jewish family, followed the Jewish customs, followed the Jewish traditions, and at the age of 30, he began his public ministry, preaching, teaching about God's love and the, the coming of the kingdom of God. And he performed many miracles during his ministry, right? Including healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, his teachings were so controversial, it challenged the religious leaders of the time, but still many people followed him. Praise God. Jesus' teachings were strictly based on the Hebrew scriptures, which he interpreted in what could be called back then new and revolutionary ways. Amen? I mean, he taught about love, forgiveness, uh, the importance of serving others. His message was one of hope and salvation, redemption, and his followers believed he truly was the Messiah, the Savior promised by the Hebrew Scriptures. He seen himself in the Hebrew Scriptures and said, this is me, right? His life and teachings were a constant threat to the Roman Empire and the Jewish leadership at the time. That's why he was arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced to death by crucifixion. He died on a cross outside Jerusalem, and the disciples believed he rose from the dead three days later. And that was fulfilling the prophecies of Hebrew Scripture itself. Now, I want to look at the life of Jesus and compare them to the Jew compare this to the Jewish festivals, okay? First is Passover. Okay, you can look, you find us in Exodus 12, Leviticus 23, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 John 1. Uh, there, there are several scriptures, okay? Passover is the most significant Jewish festival, and it commemorates Israel's exodus from Egypt. It is a seven-day festival. It begins on the 15th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. Passover celebrates the Israelites' liberation from slavery, getting their freedom, and their journey to freedom. The life of Jesus is so closely associated with Passover. Jesus' last supper with his disciples was a Passover Seder meal where he used the unleavened bread and the wine to symbolize his body and blood, which would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus' death on the cross occurred during the Passover festival and his resurrection symbolizes the freedom and liberation we can receive from sin and death. The Jewish festival of Passover has deep significance in Jewish and Christian traditions, okay? Because the Passover centers around the sacrificial lamb that was slain and the blood of the lamb is used to mark the Israelites' doorposts, protecting them from the final plague that struck down the firstborn in Egypt. The Passover lamb is a symbol of deliverance and redemption. 
The Israelites were saved from the hand of the oppressor and set free to worship God in the promised land. The tradition of sacrificing a lamb during Passover is still practiced today, although without the temple in Jerusalem, it cannot be done in the same manner as it was back in in ancient times. In addition to the Passover lamb, there is another tradition associated with the holiday that involves two goats. One goat is sacrificed as a sin offering. The other is set free to go into the wilderness. This ritual is known as the scapegoat, and it's meant to symbolize the removal of the people's sins from their midst. The practice of the scapegoat can be traced way back to the book of Leviticus, which provides instructions for the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. On this day, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the people. Now, before doing that, he, had, he would cast a lot over two goats, one to be sacrificed, the other to be released into the wilderness, carrying the sins of the people with it into the wilderness. The symbolism of the scapegoat is profound. It resents the idea that sins are not just forgiven, but removed entirely from your midst, carried away from the people, and released into the wilderness where they can no longer harm anyone. This practice underscores the importance of repentance and the need for forgiveness to be complete, not just temporary, not just a matter of words, but an act of removal and separation from sin. The scapegoat tradition took on a new meaning during the time of Jesus as it coincided with his trial and crucifixion. The Gospels record that Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, offered the crowd a choice between two prisoners to be released during the Passover festival. One was Barabbas, a notorious criminal and a rebel. The other was Jesus of Nazareth, who had been accused of blasphemy and sedition. (laughs) Oh, I have to tell you about Barabbas. Barabbas, translated, means son of God, son of Abba, which is a name for God. So they had their choice. Which son of God do you want me to release, Jesus or Barabbas? And the crowd chose the sinful one to be released. Now, another quick story of Barabbas. He was in prison. He could hear, I mean, he knew he was in prison for sedition and murder, and he knew he was going to die. He didn't know when. He hears this crowd in an uproar, and all he hears is crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And he's like, oh, man, this is not going to end good. And then he hears the guards coming. They go, this is it. They haul him out. He's, he's waiting for the execution order. I mean, he's, he's, just, he's already resigned himself to that fact. But instead, he finds himself standing before Pilate, this whole huge mob of people. He looks over, and here's this man that has been beaten and tortured so badly, he doesn't even look like a human being anymore. That's Jesus. And he doesn't know what's going on. And then Pilate says, who do you want me to release to you? And the people choose Barabbas. And he says, why? What, what, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He's been found not guilty. I have nothing to crucify him for. What is a crucify him? Or we're going to tell Caesar you're not a that you you're not a friend of Caesar's. And at that, he washes his hands, sends Jesus to his death, turns to Barabbas and says, "Get out of my sight." Think about that scenario as we go through this, because. The crowd 
urged on by the chief priests and the elders, they chose Barabbas to be released, Jesus to be crucified. This act of choosing between two prisoners mirrors the practice of the scapegoat, one being set free, the other being condemned to death to bear the sins of the people. Catch that. Being condemned to death to bear the sins of the people. That's exactly what Jesus fulfilled. In this case, it wasn't a literal goat that was released into the willows, but a human being. Barabbas, the criminal, was set free while Jesus, who had committed no crime, was crucified. The symbolism of this act is so profound and has been interpreted in so many ways by many theologians over the, the centuries, right? One interpretation, Barabbas represents humanity, which is guilty of sin, deserving of punishment. Jesus, on the other hand, represents the sacrificial lamb who's done nothing wrong and takes upon himself the sins of the people and dies in their place. In this view, the choice between Barabbas and Jesus is a choice between the sinful nature of humanity and the redemption and redemptive sacrifice of Christ. Another interpretation is that Barabbas represents the political and nationalistic aspirations of the Jewish people. He was a rebel against the Roman Empire and Roman rule. His release would have been seen as a victory for the cause of Jewish independence. Jesus, on the other hand, represented a different kind of kingdom, one they didn't understand, one that was not of this world. That's because it was spiritual in nature. and It was just confusing the people, so it's easy. Let's get rid of him. Jesus' message of love and forgiveness and peace challenged both the political and the religious authorities of his day, and that's what led to his death. The choice between Barabbas and Jesus, then, can be seen as a choice between two competing visions of the Jewish people's future. Barabbas represents a political solution to their problems, while Jesus, just a spiritual solution, solution. Hey, okay, it's nice and all that, but it doesn't help me right now. The crowd's choice to release Barabbas and crucify Jesus was a rejection of the spiritual solution that would have fixed all their problems forever, but an affirmation of their political earthly aspirations. This interpretation, folks, is supported by the fact that Jesus was not the only one who claimed to be the Messiah during his time. There were many messianic figures who rose up against Roman rule and promised to lead the Jewish people to freedom. Barabbas was one of those figures, and his release would have been seen as a victory for the cause of Jewish nationalism. But the story of Barabbas and Jesus also has a deeper significance in the context of the scapegoat tradition. Just as the scapegoat was released into the wilderness to carry the sins of the people away, Barabbas was released into the world carrying the sins of the people with him. In this sense, he became a symbol of the collective guilt of humanity, which is passed on from generation to generation to generation to you and to me. Jesus, on the other hand, takes on the sins of the people and dies in their place. He becomes the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect lamb who atones for all the sins of the world. His death and resurrection represents a victory over sin and death and a pathway to redemption and eternal life for all of us. The comparison between the scapegoat tradition and the story of Barabbas and Jesus highlights the central theme of the Christian message. It underscores the importance of about the forgiveness and the atonement and the need we have for a Savior to take away the sins of the world. It also speaks to the conflict between the political and the spiritual realms, the tension between worldly power and divine grace. Furthermore, the story of Barabbas and Jesus highlights the choice humans have in our destiny. The crowd's choice to release Barabbas and crucify Jesus was probably the most pivotal point in human history. One that would have a profound implication for the future of the Jewish people and around the world. It shows how even seemingly small choices 
can have far, far reaching consequences. And how our decisions today shape our lives and the world around us tomorrow. In conclusion, of this part, the story of Barabbas, this is a powerful illustration of the themes about sacrifice, redemption, choice. All these that are central themes to the Christian message. The comparison between the scapegoat tradition and the events of the crucifixion underscores the importance of forgiveness and atonement. The need we have for a Savior that takes away our sins and the sins of the whole world. It also highlights the tension between a worldly power and divine grace, the role of choice in shaping human destiny, and the choices we make to fulfill it. As such, this remains a profound and meaningful story that I just wanted to share with you as we start this study because it resonates with believers and non-believers alike. Amen? Next up is Shabbat, the Pentecost. Shabbat is one of the seven major Jewish festivals. It's known as the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. It's celebrated for seven weeks, 49 days. And the 50th day is the day after, you know, starting the day after Passover. And the 50th day is where it's fulfilled. It gives, it marks the giving of the Torah to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. The festival is so significant because it represents the covenant that exists between God and the Jewish people and the start of their spiritual journey. Now in the New Testament, the fulfillment of the requirements of Savat is seen in the events surrounding Jesus' ascension. According to the Gospel of Luke, after his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days. This period is significant because it represents the time between Passover and Shabbat, during which the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and received the Torah. During this 40-day period, Jesus continues to teach his disciples about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. He also gave them the Great Commission, instructing them to go and make disciples of all nations. That's not countries. Like we would use nations today, that's called ethnic groups. All groups of people everywhere. This commissioning is similar to the Jewish tradition of spreading the Torah and making converts. On the day of Shabbat, the disciples were gathered together in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit descended upon them in the form of tongues of fire. That's the day of Shabbat that we call Pentecost. And it's seen as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel in Joel 2.28, I believe it is, which states that God will pour out his spirit upon all people in the last days. The significance of Jesus' ascension on the day of the festival is twofold. First, it represents the completion of his mission on earth and his return to the Father. It is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, where this states that the Son of Man will ascend to the throne of God and receive all power and all authority. Second, Jesus' ascension marks the beginning of a new era in the Holy Spirit, where it's poured out upon all believers, not just Jewish people. This re represents a shift from a focus on the Jewish laws and Jewish traditions and a focus on on the Spirit, and a universal message of salvation that's available to all people, you and I included. Amen? And the comparisons between Shabbat and the fulfillment of its requirements by Jesus highlights the, the continuity, I guess you could say, between Judaism and Christianity. Both traditions emphasize the importance of a covenant with God and a spiritual journey towards redemption that we are living on a daily basis. They also share a focus on the spread of their respective messages and, and the importance of sharing these messages and making converts to the gospel. However, the fulfillment, 
The fulfillment of the requirements of Shabbat by Jesus also represents a radical departure from Jewish traditions. It represents a new covenant between God and humanity, based not on strict adherence to the law, but on faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and that he was the sacrifice for our sin, that he is the sacrifice for others' sins, that he will always be the sacrifice for the sins for new people coming to the Lord, and He's still there for us today when we mess up on a daily basis. It's not one and done and you're forgotten, son. All right? You sin today, you go back to Jesus. Lord, I am so sorry I said that. I should not have done that thing. I did it. I, I know. I knew it was wrong when I did it. I repent. And you receive your forgiveness. Praise God for Jesus. Amen? Now, The comparisons between Shavat and the fulfillment of its requirements by Jesus highlights the continuity and discontinuity between Judaism and Christianity. They illustrate the importance of a covenant with God and a spiritual journey we are going on a daily basis towards redemption, as well as the radical shift towards a new covenant based only on faith in Jesus. The ascension of Jesus on the day of the festival marks the completion of his mission on earth and the beginning of a new era in which the Holy Spirit is poured out on all believers. Praise God. Next is Sukkot. Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Praise God. Or Booths. It's also called the, the Feast of Booths. And it's the third of the three pilgrimage festivals in Judaism. It is celebrated on the 15th day of the Jewish month of Teshri, and it lasts again for seven days. During the festival, Jews are commanded to dwell in temporary booths, or Sukkot, as a reminder of the time when the, when the, the Israelites wandered in the desert and lived in temporary shelters. The festival has both agricultural and historical significance. It is a time of thanksgiving for the harvest, as well as a commemoration of God's protection and provision during the journey, the Israelites' journey, while they were in the wilderness. Sukkot also looks forward to the messianic era, when God will dwell with his people in a new tabernacle. In the New Testament, guess what? Jesus fulfills the festival of Sukkot, not just fulfilling it, but he does so in several different ways. First, his birth is linked to the feast. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus was born during the time of Sukkot. This links Jesus to the theme of dwelling, as he's the embodiment of God's presence on earth, dwelling among his people. Second, Jesus teaches and performs miracles during Sukkot. In the Gospel of John, Jesus teaches in the temple during the festival, declaring himself to be the source of living water and the light of the world. He also heals a blind man, which is seen as a symbol of the spiritual blindness that is being removed in the Messianic era. Third, Jesus' death and resurrection fulfill the themes of Sukkot. Just as the Israelites were protected and provided for in the wilderness, Jesus' death and resurrection provided protection and provision for those who believe in him. He is the true tabernacle, the dwelling place of God among his people. Praise God. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. I'm starting to get excited now. We're starting to get into good stuff now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Finally, the Holy Spirit, which is often associated with the festival of Sukkot, is poured out on the disciples after Jesus' ascension. This event's recorded in the second chapter of the book of Acts, of course, and is known as Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is seen as the fulfillment of the promise in Joel 2, 28-32, that God will pour out His Spirit on all people in the last days. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit is so significant because it represents the completion of Jesus' work on this earth. And it represents the beginning of a new era in which God's presence will dwell 
with his people on this earth forever. This is similar to the theme of Sakat, which looks forward to the time when God will dwell with his people in a new tabernacle on this earth. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit empowers the disciples to spread the message of Jesus and make disciples of all nations. This again is similar to the Jewish tradition of spreading the message of the Torah and making new converts. The Holy Spirit is also seen as the source of living water and the source of this light into the world, which are the themes again associated with Sakat. So Jesus fulfills the festival of Sakat in several ways, including his birth, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. These fulfillments highlight the continuity that exists between Judaism and Christianity and illustrates the themes of dwelling and protection and provision that are central to both traditions. The, the pouring out. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit represents the completion of of Jesus' work on earth and the beginning of a new era in which God dwells in his people, with his people, on this earth. Wherever you go, he goes. Praise God. And that fulfills the theme of Sakat and the looking forward to the messianic age. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying this study. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to the next one. Rosh Hashanah. That's the Jewish New Year. It falls on the first and second days of the Jewish month of Tishri. It is the first of the most holy high days, which include Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and marks the beginning of 10 days of repentance, which leads up to Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is a time of, of introspection. A time of a time of reflection as Jews seek to make amends for past wrongs and commit themselves to living a better future. You can read about this in Leviticus uh, 16, Hebrews 9, John 2, and I think it's first John 2, but in the New Testament, Jesus fulfills the theme of Rosh Hashanah in several ways. First, again, his birth is linked to the festival. While Jesus was not actually born on Rosh Hashanah, the festival of his birth, which we call Christmas, falls close to the same time of year. The idea of a new beginning, which is central to Rosh Hashanah, is reflected in the concept of Jesus' birth as a new beginning for humanity. Second, Jesus' ministry reflects the themes of repentance and introspection that are central to Rosh Hashanah. Jesus consistently calls people to repentance and urges them to turn away from their sinful ways. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the the parable of the prodigal son, which emphasizes the importance of repentance and the joy that comes from returning to a loving father, our God. Third, Jesus' death and resurrection fulfill the themes of judgment and forgiveness that are central to Rosh Hashanah. According to Christian theology, Jesus' death paid the penalty for the sins of all humanity, making forgiveness possible before it there was no possibility unless you adhered strictly to the law. Now, Jesus gives us the possibility of knowing our sins are forgiven forever. That never existed before. His resurrection is seen as a victory over death and a sign of hope for new beginning. Finally, Jesus' return is often associated with the themes of judgment and redemption that are both central to Rosh Hashanah and Christianity. In Christian theology, the return of Jesus is seen as a time of judgment when the faithful will be separated from the unfaithful. This is similar to the Jewish tradition of the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, which represents both the judgment 
and the hope of a better future. Jesus fulfills the festival of Rosh Hashanah in several ways, including his birth, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, his promise to return. These fulfillments highlight the continuity between Judaism and Christianity. They illustrate the themes of new beginnings, repentance, forgiveness, judgment, that are all central to both Jewish and Christian traditions. The concepts of repentance and introspection that are central to Rosh Hashanah are reflected in Jesus' ministry and his death and his resurrection as seen as fulfilling the themes of judgment and forgiveness. The promise of his return reflects the Jewish tradition of blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, which represents both judgment and the hope of a better future. Praise the Lord. That takes up to Yom Kippur. Now you can read about this in Leviticus 16, Hebrews 9, 1 John 2 again. Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, is the most solemn and holy day in the entire Jewish calendar. It is a time of repentance and atonement for your sins and is marked by fasting and prayer and self-reflection. In the New Testament, Jesus is seen as fulfilling the themes of Yom Kippur in several different ways. First, Jesus is seen as the ultimate sacrifice for sin, according to Christian theology. Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for the sins of humanity, making atonement, making it possible. I mean, this is similar to Jewish tradition of offering sacrifices on Yom Kippur as a way of atoning for sin. Second, Jesus is seen as the high priest who offers the sacrifice for sin. In the Jewish tradition, the high priest played a central role in the atonement rituals on Yom Kippur. Jesus is seen as having fulfilled that role by offering himself as the sacrifice for sin. Third, Jesus' teachings emphasize the importance of forgiveness and repentance, which are central themes, again, of Yom Kippur. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples to forgive others as they have been forgiven by God. This emphasis on forgiveness is also reflected in Jesus' teaching of the Lord's Prayer, which includes the line, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I.e., if you don't forgive them, you don't get forgiveness. Think about how serious that is. Finally, the promise of Jesus' return is seen as a fulfillment of the themes of judgment and redemption that are central to Yom Kippur. And Christian theology in the Bible, the return of Jesus is seen as a time of judgment when the faithful will be separated from the unfaithful. This is similar again to Jewish tradition of Yom Kippur where the book of life is opened and the fate of each person determined for the coming year. Oh boy, this is good. Jesus fulfills the festival of Yom Kippur in several ways, including his role as the ultimate sacrifice, his role as the high priest, his teachings on forgiveness and repentance, and his promised return. These fulfillments highlight the connection between Judaism and Christianity and illustrates very clearly the themes of atonement and forgiveness and judgment and redemption that are central to both traditions. The idea of sacrifice for sin is reflected in Jesus' death on the cross and his role as high priest is seen in his offering of himself as the perfect sacrifice. Jesus' teachings on forgiveness and repentance are similar to the themes of Yom Kippur and the promise of his return. The Jewish tradition talks about the book of life. Next up is Hanukkah. Oh, you're talking about Christmas. No, I'm talking about Hanukkah. Hanukkah is known as the Festival of Lights. It's a Jewish holiday that commemorates the rededication of the temple. In Jerusalem, after its desecration by the Syrian and Greek army in 168 BCE, before Common Era. We used to call it just BC. But the holiday is celebrated for eight days again, during which times Jews light candles in a special menorah 
and they recite prayers of thanksgiving and remembrance. In the New Testament, Jesus is seen as fulfilling the themes of Hanukkah in several ways, including his role as the light of the world, which will be central in the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus' declaration that he is the light of the world in John 8, 12 emphasizes his importance as the source of spiritual illumination and understanding. This statement echoes the lighting of the Hanukkah candles, which symbolizes the miracle of the oil that burned for eight days in the temple. Jesus' followers are also called to be the light of the world in Matthew 5, 14, reflecting his teaching and spreading his message to others. Furthermore, Jesus' teachings emphasize the importance of faith and perseverance in the face of persecution, which is also a central theme of what? Hanukkah. The story of Hanukkah recounts the brave resistance of the Maccabees against the oppressive Syrian Greek army. Similarly, Jesus teaches his followers to remain faithful and steadfast even in the face of persecution and to trust in God's ultimate victory over all evil. In addition, Jesus' actions demonstrate a commitment to social justice and the liberation of the oppressed, similar to the themes of Hanukkah. Jesus' teachings on love and compassion and his actions in healing the sick and feeding the hungry reflect his commitment to social justice and the liberation again of all who are oppressed. Moreover, the coming of Jesus is seen as a fulfillment of of the hope and the expectation of the Jewish people as expressed in the celebration of Hanukkah. In the New Testament, the birth of Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Hebrew Scriptures and the hope of the Jewish people for a Messiah who would bring liberation and redemption. The fulfillment of these themes in Jesus is further amplified by the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelation 21, 23, which states, And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. This passage emphasizes that the new heaven, the new earth, will need no physical light source at all, because Jesus himself is the source of all illumination, which also interprets and translates into all spiritual understanding. Jesus' fulfillment of the festival of Hanukkah through his role as the light of the world, his teachings on faith and perseverance, his commitment to social justice and the liberation of the oppressed highlights the continuity again between Judaism and Christianity and the promise of the new heaven and the new earth. Oh, I taught on that a couple weeks ago. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm so looking forward to that the new heaven, the new earth, where Jesus will be the sole source of light, underscores the centrality of Jesus' teachings and his ultimate victory over evil. The celebration of Hanukkah and the coming of Jesus demonstrates the enduring faith of the Jewish people and the Christian belief in the ultimate victory of God over evil through Christ Jesus. Amen. And then we come to the festival of Purim. Purim. You can see this in John 3.16. Purim is a Jewish festival that commemorates the salvation of the Jewish people from a plot to destroy them during the time of the Persian Empire. The story of Purim is recorded in the book of Esther, which tells us how the Jewish queen Esther aided by her cousin Mordecai, used her influence with the king to expose and foil the plot of Haman, a wicked prime minister who sought to annihilate the Jews. The festival is celebrated on the 14th and 15th days of the Hebrew month of Adar and is characterized by feasting, gift-giving, and the reading from the book of Esther. While Purim is not specifically mentioned in the New Testament, there are several ways in which Jesus can be seen as fulfilling the themes of the festival. For example, the story of Purim emphasizes the importance of courage, the importance of faith and providence in the face of adversity, all of which are central themes of Jesus' teachings. Moreover, Jesus teaches 
the importance of standing up for the oppressed and the marginalized, which is a central theme in the story of Purim. In the story of Esther, Esther risks her very own life to save the Jewish people from annihilation, exemplifying the kind of, of self-sacrifice and courage that Jesus also demonstrated in his own life and his own teachings. Amen? Furthermore, the story of Purim highlights the importance of providence and divine intervention in human affairs. In the story, the Jewish people are saved through a series of seemingly random events that ultimately lead to their deliverance. Similarly, Jesus' teachings emphasize the importance of trust and faith in God's providence and his ability to work out the details even in ways we don't see them being worked out. And the end result is complete victory on our behalf over good and over uh, for the good over evil. Amen. I mean, I, I think back to you know my military days. That's all I ever wanted to do was be in the military. I, I to this day I love this stuff. But God had other plans. Imagine being ripped out of the ground you've been planted in by the roots. That's not a hurt plant, right? But them being transported and then replanted into better ground. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, okay. I can deal with this. All right. Just about time you're getting used to that. They're ripping you up out of the roots again and putting you over in an even better place, a better ground, a better garden. And it hurts. You're like, God, why? And you know, the gardener comes in. Nurtures the soil, make sure you get watered properly, trimmed, and suddenly you're bearing fruit. And you say, "Okay, I I see this now. If I'd have stayed in that first garden, there's no way I'd be bearing this much fruit. Even over there in the second garden, I was learning things over there that I'm using now that I didn't even know before. So the transplant into this garden is actually a fulfillment of God's purpose for my life, and that's how looking back." Over the past 40 years, I see that is what's happened. Time and time again. Amen. That's what Esther was doing. She thought she was just going to, you know, be taken care of by the king. And, uh, you know, because she was poor, or she won the beauty contest. And that was God's way of taking care of her. Mordecai is thinking the same thing. And not Mordecai, Hammond. No, Mordecai. Her uncle Mordecai was thinking the same thing. And then we see the problem. And then it comes to them, this is the reason you are here. And she followed God's plan, and it worked. And we are still talking about her faith to this day. Amen? Praise God. All right. So Purim is not specifically mentioned in the New Testament. There are several ways, though, in which Jesus can be seen in fulfilling the themes of the festival through his teachings and actions. His committed to social justice, justice, the liberation of the oppressed, teachings on the importance of faith and perseverance, his ultimate victory over the powers of darkness, they all demonstrate the continuity again between Judaism and Christianity and the enduring faith of God's people throughout history. The celebration of Purim and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ serves as a powerful, powerful reminder of God's providential care and his ultimate victory over the forces of darkness and evil. Now, as we get ready to conclude, glory to God, time goes so fast. The Jewish festivals are rich, rich in meaning and significance, pointing to God's ongoing work of his redemption in the world. Each festival has its own set of requirements. Each festival has its own set of practices. And they all help to tell the story of God's faithfulness to his people. Amen? So I'm going to summarize here everything we just talked about, these Jewish festivals, and just share one more time how Jesus fulfilled the requirements of each of these festivals. Passover. The original requirement of Passover was the sacrifice of a spotless lamb and the application of its blood to the doorpost of the Israelites' home, which will protect them from the final plague that be sweeping the land. Jesus fulfilled 
this requirement through his sacrificial death on the cross, where he became the spotless lamb that was shed to redeem all of humanity. Like the scapegoat that was sent into the wilderness to carry away the sins of the people, Jesus bore the sins of the whole world on that cross and defeated the power of sin, defeated the power of death, and overcame the power of the grave through his resurrection. Next is Shabbat. The original requirement of Shabbat was the offering of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It was given as a wave offering, right? The celebration of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. That's what it originally started as. Jesus fulfilled this requirement through his own resurrection, which was the first fruits of the new creation. And through the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which marked the beginning of a new era and God's redemptive plan. The 40-day period between Jesus' resurrection and ascension parallels the 40 days Moses spent on Mount Sinai, emphasizing the continuity, the giving the Torah, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Next up is Sukkot. The original requirement of Sukkot was for a construction of a temporary dwelling, or a Sukkot, to commemorate the Israelites' wilderness journey and God's provision for them. We are in our wilderness journey right now on this earth, on our way to our promised land. Praise God, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Jesus fulfilled this through his own resurrection where he tabernacled among us as the word made flesh. He also fulfilled the requirement of the water drawing ceremony, which symbolized the provision of water in the wilderness and pointed to the coming of, Je of the Holy Spirit. Jesus declared himself to be the living water that would quench the thirst of all who would believe in him. And he promised to send the Holy Spirit to those who do believe in him. Then there's Rosh Hashanah. The original requirement of Rosh Hashanah was the blowing of the shofar, or the ram's horn, to announce that the coming of the new year had arrived, the time of judgment. Jesus fulfilled this requirement through his own announcement of the coming of the kingdom of God and his call to repentance and faith. He also filled the requirement of the scapegoat, which was sent into the wilderness to carry away the sins of the people. Jesus bore the sins of the entire world on that cross and declared the forgiveness of all sins to those who would believe in him. Not the whole world, but those who would believe in him. Which takes us to Yom Kippur, known as the Day of Atonement. It's considered the holiest day of the Jewish year. It is a day of fasting and repentance where the sins of the past year are confessed and forgiveness is sought. The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies in the temple to make an atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus fulfilled the requirement of atonement for sin through his sacrifice on the cross. The book of Hebrews describes Jesus as our high priest who entered once into the heavenly of heavenlies, the Holy of Holies, to make an atonement for our sin and for all who would believe in him. Through that one sacrifice, we have been forgiven and made righteous with God. He also fulfilled the requirement of the scapegoat, which is sent into the wilderness again to carry away the sins of the people. I keep coming back to that because it is so important. Jesus bore the sins of the world on the cross and declared the forgiveness of sins for all what? Who would believe in him? Next up is Hanukkah, known as the Festival of Lights. It commemorates the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem after it was desecrated by the Greeks. The Festival of Lights lasts for eight days, during which candles are lit in a memora to, to, a memora to symbolize the miracle of the oil that burned for eight days instead of one. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of being the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life in John 8, 12. In the book of Revelation, it's revealed that in the new heaven and new earth, there'll be no need for sun or moon because Jesus himself is the light. Then we come to Purim. 
Purim commemorates the salvation of the Jews from the plot of Haman to annihilate them. It is celebrated through the reading of the book of Esther and the giving of gifts to one another. Jesus fulfilled the requirement of salvation through his death and resurrection. Through him, we've been saved from sin, saved from death, given the gift, hallelujah, of eternal life. And as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one, his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. Praise God. So in conclusion, as we get ready to close, the festivals of the Jewish calendar were given to Israel as a way of remembering and a way of celebrating the great acts of God in their history. They also served as a foreshadowing of the ultimate redemption that would come through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Each festival had very specific requirements and Jesus fulfilled those very specific requirements throughout his life, his death, his resurrection. Through him, we have been given the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness of all our sins, and the gift of eternal life. As Christians, as believers, we can look back on these festivals and see how they point us to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, it's important to know that while these festivals and their requirements were given to the Jewish people, the ultimate fulfillment of all of it came through Jesus and is applicable to believers everywhere, both Jew and Gentile, praise God. But there's only one way of receiving that, and that's by receiving Jesus as the fulfillment of all of these requirements. Amen. And you can only do that by faith. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in him, Jesus. And as I, my, I tried my best today to share, he fulfilled all seven of the Jewish festivals. All you have to do is believe in him. And you do that by saying this simple prayer. Father God, I know I'm a sinful person. I know I've committed sins. Oh, if you were to stack my sins, Father, they go high up into heaven. But, Jesus, oh, thank you, Jesus. But, Jesus died to take away every one of those sins from my account. I am forgiven right now. I am a child of the Most High God, right now. And I thank you for it, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. Let us know. If you don't have your own Bible, I want to send you one for Easter, or Resurrection, or Passover, whatever you call it. I want to send you one. Just write and email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. Let me know you need a Bible. I'll send it out to you. I'll pay the postage on it. Just remember, though, it's only in the continental United States. Till next time, folks, Pastor Bob, remind you, be blessed in all that you do.